makers of fantastic cigarettes. Fantastic cigarettes, long in the leaf and short in the can, bring you the Weathertop Radio Mystery Theater. Tonight, we present David Bryant's adaptation of M.R. James's chilling story about a very haunted room in a very haunted hotel. A little story we call... Number 13. Among the towns of Denmark, Viborg justly holds a high place. It has a handsome cathedral, a charming garden, a lake of great beauty, and many storks. There are a good number of excellent hotels in Viborg, and my cousin, Hans Andersen, whose experiences I have to tell you now, stayed at a hotel called the Golden Lion the first time he visited Viborg. He has refused to visit Viborg since, and the following story will perhaps explain the reason for his abstention. Well, Herr Christensen, I must say that I'm delighted with your magnificent hotel. Just look at the way the sun warms up the color of that ancient stone and brickwork. The gables, the old-fashioned text over the front door, the courtyard. It's marvelous. Simply marvelous. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Herr Anderson, the Golden Lion is one of the very few houses that was not destroyed in the Great Fire of 1726. It practically demolished the entire town. The cathedral, some municipal buildings, everything was burned down. Well, thank heavens this place was spared. I am really looking forward to spending some time at your hotel. It's the epitome of the charm of old Denmark. Thank you, Herr Anderson, thank you. Now, if you will please follow me, I will lead you to your room. One of my men will take your luggage. Please, let us go. But it was not merely pleasure that brought my cousin to Viborg. He was engaged upon some research into the church history of Denmark, and it came to his knowledge that in the town archives of Viborg there lay some papers saved from the Great Fire of 1726 relating to the last days of Roman Catholicism in that country. He proposed to spend a few weeks studying these manuscripts firsthand to aid in his research. I understand that you'll need a rather large room with some good afternoon light in which to work. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. You see, Frau Scavanius... <laughs> Who? Ah, she's in charge of the historical archives here in Viborg. She was kind enough to give me permission to take certain manuscripts back here to my hotel room to study after the archives have closed for the day. So I'll need a room that serves as a bedroom and a study. Well, then, may I suggest room number 12? 
It's right here on the second floor, so you won't have too many steps after a hard day's work at the archives. <laughs> and it should be large enough for your needs. Right here. Ah, yes. Three large and lovely windows overlooking the main street. Lots of light. The room is certainly large enough. Yes, I think this will do nicely. Thank you, Herr Christensen. Oh, uh, you are most welcome, Herr Anderson. <laughs> Dinner is at five o'clock in the dining room downstairs. Uh, I will see you then. Thank you, Herr Christensen. See you at dinner. Yeah, goodbye. As my cousin descended the stairs to the dining room, he noticed a large blackboard on the landing of the stairs. As was the custom in Denmark at the time, the names of the lodgers at the Golden Lion Inn were displayed on this blackboard along with their occupation, duration of stay, and their room number. Anderson noticed the odd assortment of salesmen, lawyers, and fellow travelers. The list was not exciting. The only thing that seemed unusual was the absence of any room numbered 13 from the list of rooms. He could not help wondering whether the objection to a room number 13 was so widespread and so strong as to make it difficult to rent a room so numbered. He resolved to ask the owner, Mr. Christensen, if he and his colleagues in the hotel business had actually met with clients who refused to stay in room number 13 due to this superstition. Well, Herr Christensen, dinner was delicious. Ah, a perfect meal. Please, give my regards to your fine cook. Why, thank you, Herr Anderson, thank you. I, I will do that. Would you care to have a drink here at the bar with me, now that you have finished your dinner? Ah, ah thank you, thank you, but no. I'm pretty tired from the long trip today. I'm really looking forward to a good night's sleep. Perhaps another night? Certainly, Herr Anderson, certainly. Uh, I wish you a pleasant evening and a sound sleep. Breakfast is at seven. Thank you, Herr Christensen. Good night. Yeah, yeah. Good night. Good night. My cousin went back to his room spent the rest of the evening unpacking and arranging his clothes, books, and papers, and toward 11 o'clock, decided to go to bed. Just as he was settling in to read for a few moments before putting out his light, he realized that he'd left his book in the dining room and went downstairs to retrieve it. Okay, that only took a second. What's this? Why won't this blasted thing open? I don't remember locking my door. That's odd. This must be the wrong door. Let's see what the... Why... This door says number 13. Room number 13? My own room must be on the left. And so it is. Interesting, having a room number 13 but not renting it out, or even posting it on the board downstairs. I wonder if... Oh, now what's this? My own room seems smaller. Much smaller. 
I'd better get some sleep. I'm starting to imagine things. The next day, Anderson woke, had a fine breakfast, and headed over to the Viborg Town Archives, where he met with the head archivist, Frau Scavanius. Well, Herr Anderson, here are the documents that you've requested. As I mentioned before, most of the papers perished in the Great Fire of 1726, but we have managed to save quite a few. Enough, perhaps, to suit your purposes. Thank you very much, Frau Scavanius. I'll just lay them out here. Please let me know if there is anything else I can help you with. I'm not what you'd call uh, an expert in your field, but I do know quite a bit about the documents in our archive. Thank you again, Frau Scavanius. You are most welcome. Please take what you need back to your hotel if you like, as long as you return them tomorrow. Let's see what we have here. A bundle of official papers dated 1560. Correspondence of one Bishop Jürgen Fries. Jürgen Fries, the last Catholic bishop to hold the post here in Viborg. Exactly what I'm looking for. Let's see, let's see. Private papers, edicts, church decrees. Hello, what's this? A letter from Rasmus Nielsen, the leader of the opposing Protestant party. <laughs> well, well, the two adversaries meet. Uh, let's see what he has to say to our dear Bishop Jürgen Fries. You are a disgrace to the city. Disgrace to the city and to the entire population of God-fearing Christians throughout the land. You have brought scandal and are a stumbling block to the entire Reformed Party inasmuch as your practicing of certain secret and wicked arts, having sold your immortal soul to the sworn enemy of mankind. It is representative of the gross corruption and superstition of the Babylonish church that such a viper and blood-sucking sorcerer as Mog Nicholas Franken should be patronized and harbored by you, the so-called bishop of the church. That Mog Franken is by all accounts an agent of Satan himself and has contributed mightily to the downfall of his fellow man in that he continually practices abhorrent rights of... Abhorrent rights of... Abhorrent rights of... Of what? Ah, it's torn right off. The rest of the page is missing. Well, that's a pretty serious accusation. Let's see if we have any kind of response from our dear bishop. Ah, here we are. I protest and wholeheartedly refute all, all of your spurious allegations. And furthermore, take this opportunity to publicly state my own abhorrence of all matters of the kind which you unwisely and flagrantly assert and ascribe to my person. Namely, the practicing of certain secret and black arts. As to the case of Mag Nicholas Franken, I believe him to be innocent of all charges levied against him. He will continue to live in my house, under my patronage, until I see fit to sever the relationship. No one more 
more than myself would be willing to condemn these behaviors. And if you can prove any of your preposterous allegations, I myself will be the first to come forward publicly and cry for the harshest of punishments upon his head. Methinks he doth protest too much. I wonder who this mysterious Mag Nicholas Franken was. Herr Anderson. I'm going to be leaving for the day in a few minutes. Is there anything else I can assist you with? Uh, no, 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 thank you. I've had a very productive day. And a rather interesting one at that. I do have a question for you now that you mention it. Yes, sir. The house in which Bishop Fries lived and supposedly sheltered the infamous Mag Nicholas Franken, is that house by some remote chance still standing? Interesting that you should ask. I have done research into that very question, and I have to say that while every evidence exists that the building did survive the Great Fire, I simply cannot locate its whereabouts. The one piece of manuscript evidence that would definitely locate the property is torn away at the very spot that would furnish the information. As for Meg Franken, well, he's acquired a legendary status here locally, and I'm afraid it's not a very pleasant legend. Perhaps you'd be so kind as to share the legend with me? Uh, some other time, perhaps. It's getting late, and I must be getting home. I'll uh, see you tomorrow, I hope. Yes. Yes. Tomorrow it is. Well, thank you for all your help, Frau Scavanius. Not at all, Herr Anderson. After taking some exercise, I forget exactly how or where, my cousin went back to the Golden Lion Inn, his supper, his game of solitaire, and his bed. On the way to his room, it occurred to him that he had forgotten to talk to the owner of the hotel about the omission of room number 13 from the blackboard on the stairs landing. He also wanted to make sure that room number 13 did in fact exist before he made any mention of it. Well, that's that. There it is, plain as day. A solid wooden door with the number 13 attached very clearly. So there really is a room 13 in this hotel. There seems to be someone inside. Let me just put my ear up to the door to see if I can hear anything. Uh, yes, well, it's obviously occupied. I'll get back to my own room now. Strange how this place looks so much smaller at night than during the day. What a disturbing effect. Well, I suppose I should lay out my supplies for tomorrow's researches and... What? Where's my briefcase? I put it right here on the table next to the dresser. I'm sure of it. Where is it? Damn it, this is exasperating. Apparently the table was missing too. First the mysteriously appearing room 13, and now this. Ugh. Maybe the chambermaid took it by accident. Yes, that must be what happened. I'll speak with her in the morning. For now, it's off to sleep before something else happens. But in his agitated state, 
Sleep did not come to my cousin. Much too upset to sleep, he lit a cigarette and stood at the window, the far right window, and looked out on the quiet night streets below. The light from his room was behind him, and he could see his own shadow clearly cast on the wall opposite. He could also see the shadow of the bearded man in room number 11 on the left, brushing his hair. And he could see the shadow of the occupant on the right. The occupant of room number 13. Hmm. He's leaning on the window looking out at the night, too. I'd love to get a good look at him. Impossible to tell if number 13's a man or woman from the shadow. Seems to be tall and very thin, though. What on earth does he have on his head? Looks like a strange kind of pointed hood. What a weird lighting effect that is. That flickering red light like flames. Flames without smoke. I've got to see what number 13 looks like. Maybe if I just lean out of the window like this, crane my neck out just a little like this, Look at that. He's disappeared and the lights went out. <sighs> I suppose it's time to get some sleep now. I'll just put out my cigarette and lay the butt here on the windowsill so it doesn't stink up the room. Uh, I'm feeling quite sleepy now. It's time to turn out the light and get to bed. There's plenty of work for me to do in the morning. The next morning, as the chambermaid came in to tidy the room and bring new linens, my cousin accosted her regarding the matter of his briefcase. Good morning, sir. Excuse me. Yes, good morning. Uh, um, please bring my briefcase back immediately. I needed some materials last night. It was extremely inconvenient to not have it here. <laughs> Your what, sir? Did you say... Brief case? Yes, my briefcase. <laughs> my brief case? <laughs> Look here, I see nothing funny about this matter at all. Sir, and uh, if you... Uh, um, sir, your briefcase is right there, on the table. What? By the dresser. It's right there, where you left it yesterday, sir. Will there be anything else? Uh, no. No. It, yeah. <laughs> I mean, no. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Bye-bye. I must be going crazy. I could have sworn that the briefcase and the table were missing last night. And now here they both are, exactly where I left them yesterday. <sighs> Maybe I'll get a little fresh air over here at the window. <sighs> what a beautiful morning. Ugh, what have I squished my hand into here on the windowsill? What? I really am losing my mind. I could have sworn that I smoked my cigarette last night at the far right window, and now here's the cigarette butt in the middle window? It's like my room shrunk last night and got bigger this morning. Okay, okay, steady, Hans. Steady. There's got to be a rational explanation for all this. What I need is a good, solid Danish breakfast. That'll fix everything. Hmm. 
Hmm. I see my neighbor in room 13 left their boots out in the hall. And they're men's work boots. So the occupant of room 13 must be a man after all. But, but this door says number 14. Wait, wait a minute. Let me see here. Room 11. Room 12. This is my room. And right next door to me is... Room 14. There is no room 13 this morning. There is simply no room 13. Later that morning, Anderson was back with Frau Scavanius at the Viborg Archives. I have located the only other correspondence related to the matter of Bishop Jorgen Fries. Here it is, Herr Anderson. Thank you, Frau Scavanius. Let's see what we have here. This looks like a letter from Bishop Jorgen Fries to Rasmus Nielsen. Although we are not in the least degree inclined, inclined to assent to your judgment concerning our court, and shall be prepared, if need be, to withstand you to the uttermost in that behalf. Yet for as much as our trusty and well-beloved Mog Nicholas Franken against whom you have dared to allege certain false and malicious charges, hath been suddenly removed from among us. It is apparent that the question for this time falls moot. Suddenly removed from among us? Suddenly removed from among us? What does that mean? Does that mean he died? How convenient. Only two days between Rasmus's letter and this letter from the bishop, in which the evil Mag Franken has apparently died. Problem solved. It's a little too convenient. Very, very suspicious. Well, that's about all the work I can do for the day. I suppose it would be a good time to make my way back to the hotel and get some supper. Here's your dinner. What are these? They are fresh beets. Beets? I hate beets. Ah, hey Anderson, how was the food? A delicious dinner, Herr Christensen. Absolutely first rate. Thank you, Herr Anderson. Thank you. Herr Christensen. Yeah, one moment. Eat some. They will make you strong. I don't care if they'll make me strong. I have a question which I believe you are uniquely qualified to answer. <laughs> okay, I will do my best. They smell like garbage. They are not garbage. They are beets. I'm not eating them. Oh, my God, this child is a pain. My question is simply this. What is the reason for why in most of the hotels one visits in this country, the number 13 is left out of the list of rooms? I, I see you have none listed on your board here. <laughs> to think that you should have noticed a thing like that. <laughs> uh, anyway... Uh, I've thought about it once or twice myself, to tell you the truth, but an educated man, I've always said, has no business with these superstitious notions. Then you don't think there is any particular objection to having a number 13? Oh, no, not at all, no. And when you came here, was there a number 13? I was going to tell you about that. You see, in a place like this, the commercial class... The travelers, they are what we have to provide for in general. Well, put them in room number 13? Why, they'd as soon sleep in the street or sooner. 
As far as I am concerned myself, it wouldn't make a penny difference to me what number my room was, and so I've often said to them, but they stick to it that it brings them bad luck. They have dozens of stories about people who have slept in room number 13 have never been the same again, or they, well, one thing or another. You know how stories go. Then what do you use your number 13 for? My number 13? My number 13? <laughs> Why, don't I just tell you that there isn't such a thing in my house? Um, if there was a number 13, why, it would be right next to your room. Well, yes, only I happened to notice, uh, um, that is, I thought last night, that I saw a door numbered 13 in the hallway. And, and really, I am almost certain that I'm right, because I saw it the night before as well. <laughs> That's ridiculous. Surely you're joking. You're... No, no, you're not joking. Well, all the same, I should think that the strong Swedish cognac might be responsible for just such a hallucination, oh, oh, no insult intended, of course. No, of course not. All the same, I would appreciate your coming up to my room this evening and making certain, if it's not too much trouble. You are serious? I am. Oh, well, I, I'm not so sure if it's healthy to indulge this kind of fantasy. I, still, I, I suppose that... Uh, uh, Herr Christensen... I have some delightful cigars from Havana with me. Perhaps we could simply share one later in my room. It would be most helpful for me to determine whether this uh, daydream is real, or, as I am beginning to suspect, a product of an overactive imagination coupled with an overtired body. (gasps) Cigars? From Havana? I love good cigars. Well, shall we say, oh, ten o'clock, Herr Anderson? Thank you, Herr Christensen, thank you. Ten o'clock will be just fine. I'd rather have bacon. Oh, shut up. Ah, this is indeed a fine cigar, Herr Anderson. (laughs) Thank you, Herr Christensen. I appreciate your coming up here to my room to uh, humor me. I always say that there's nothing like a fine cigar after a good meal to... What in God's name is that? Uh, I don't understand it. Oh, it's dreadful. Uh, Perhaps, uh, perhaps it was a cat. A cat? That's no cat. And what's more, it seems to be coming from right next door. That's that's the lawyer's room, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. It's Herr Jensen's room. He is an old customer. Is he insane? Oh, he must be. And what a sad thing. Such a good customer, too. And so successful in his business, by what I hear. Oh, and a young family to bring up. Look here. You can see his shadow on the wall opposite. He seems to be dancing. Look at the shadow. His arms waving and and legs kicking. He seems agile enough. Yeah, yeah, dancing and wailing like that. He must be insane. Such a shame, such a shame. I beg your pardon, sir, but I should be much obliged if you'd kindly desist from... uh... What? Why, then, it's not you, but... but who? What in the name of heaven does this mean? Where is it? What is it? Am I going out of my mind? Surely, Herr Jensen, it comes from your room next door. Maybe there's a cat or something stuck in the chimney? A cat? Impossible! Impossible! Uh, There is no chimney. I came here because I was convinced that the noise was going on here. 
It was certainly coming from the room next to mine. Was there no door between yours and mine? No, sir. Uh, at least not this morning. Ah, what about tonight? Uh, oh, uh, well, uh, I, I couldn't say. Uh, I'm not sure. Come, come, what have you to say here, Christensen? What on earth does this mean? For good heavens, how should I tell? I know nothing, no more than you gentlemen. I pray I may never hear such a noise again. Oh, so do I. But we must do something, the three of us. Shall we go and investigate in the next room? But, but, but that is Herr Jensen's room. It's no use. He has come from there himself. Eh, I'm not so sure. I think this gentleman is right. We must go and see. Here, take this umbrella. I'll take my walking stick. Let's go see about this. Here's the door. Oh, it's gone deadly quiet now, now. There's a light under the door. There must be someone in there. Herr Christensen, will you go and fetch the strongest servants you have in the place? We must see this through. Yeah, yeah, of course. I'll be right back with someone who can help. Perhaps my young cousin Nils will be able to... Look at this, Herr Jensen. There is your room to the right, number 14. And there is mine to the left, number 12. Yes. There is also, uh, this door. Herr Jensen, look at the number on this door. Oh, why it's... Yes. Number 13. My God, an arm came out of the door. Not not a healthy arm, a thin, sickly arm wrapped in ragged yellow linen, like a decayed shroud. And the, the bare, mottled skin had, had long gray hair on it. it. It looked as if it belonged to someone, someone long dead. My God, man, that... That thing in room 13, he, I mean it, spoke your name. Oh my god, oh my god. Here, you look faint. Let's go back to my room and lock ourselves in until Christensen comes back. Yes, yes, let's go right now. Gentlemen, here we are. I have brought my young cousin Nils. Oh, he is a good, strong boy with a good, solid crowbar. Excellent. Let's see who's in this room now. You, take your crowbar to that door and break it down. We'll soon have an answer to this mystery. Okay, Nils, put some muscle into it. Hit it as hard as you can. Okay, here we go. One. Two, uh, three! Father, will you look at that? It's 
Why, it's just a plaster wall. There's my door over there, and... Uh, my door right next to it over here. Oh, goodness. Look at the gash on the plaster wall. Boy, Nils, you certainly gave that a good swing. I swear there was a door there a minute ago. I know I hit it square in the center. Uh, right smack in the center of that door. But look at that. Oh, I can't get over it. There's simply no longer a door. Or even a room here. Yes. Number 13 seems to have passed out of all earthly existence. It's morning. Look at the window there, at the end of the passage. The night is over. <sighs> morning at last. <clears throat> uh, gentlemen, perhaps uh, you would like another room on the house, as they say. Uh, that is a different room on a different floor. Would that be suitable? Uh, yes, uh, uh, that would be perfect, Herr Christensen. Yes, perfect. The next morning, the same parties reassembled in room number 12. Herr Christensen was naturally anxious to avoid engaging outside help, and yet, it was imperative that the mystery attached to that part of the house be solved. The furniture was cleared away, and at the cost of a good many irretrievably damaged floor planks, the portion of floor was taken up which lay nearest to room number 14. You will naturally suppose that a skeleton say, of Mag Nicholas Franken, was discovered beneath the floorboards. That was not so. What they did find lying between the beams which supported the flooring was a small copper box. In it, was a neatly folded vellum document with about 20 lines of writing in some unknown language. At the bottom of the document, the signature of Bishop Jorgen Fries was quite legible. And although the vellum was faded and ancient, one could plainly see that the liquid used to sign the name at the bottom was indeed blood. My cousin, Hans Andersen, who has given me his word of honor that this story is true, steadfastly refuses to draw any inferences from this final piece of information. Perhaps for his sanity's sake, he also refuses to even listen to any inferences I might draw for him. have been listening to The Weathertop Radio Mystery Theater. Tonight, our production of number 13 was adapted especially for the Weathertop Radio Mystery Theater by David Bryant and starred Kevin Monahan as Anderson 
Kumri Drake. As Christensen and Bishop Jorgen Fries. Janine Bryant. As Frau Scavanius and the Maid. Mark Young. As Rasmus Nielsen. Fergus McDougal. As Jensen. Noah Bryant. As Nils. Nate Bryant. As the naughty kid in the cafe. Number 13 was composed and conducted by David Bryant and featured the Wetherill Treehouse Symphony. Thank you for listening. Good night and... Pleasant dreams. Turn from my hotel at 10 o'clock p.m. The waiters think I am unwell. I do not care for them, for them. But when I've locked my chamber door and put my boots outside, I dance, I dance, I dance, I dance, I dance, I dance, I dance all night upon the floor. And even if my neighbor swore I'd go on dancing all the more, or I'm acquainted with the lore, and in despite of all their joy. Their protests, their protests, the protests, the protests, the protests, the protests, the protests, the protests, I deride. I dance, 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 Foley cues and vocal scripts are available. Number 13 is also available in a variety of different performance option packages, including Foley and orchestral background recordings. For more information, please contact David Bryant at David H. Bryant 1961 at gmail. Dot com. Look at me, I'm dancing. Dancing, I'm dancing. Judy, look, Judy, look, I'm dancing. I'm dancing. <laughs> <laughs>